Hi, I'm Mary Troy, uh, the author of Swimming on Highway N. And I want to say I'm proud, very proud to be a Moon City Press author and also to have been specially selected for uh, in the Missouri Author Series. I'm reading now in my cluttered office, which was never meant to be a studio, uh, but these are weird times. So um, I have held the book up and I'm going to do it again so you see how beautiful it is. There's also a postcard of it perched precariously on my printer. It's done by the marvelous, the, the book design, the cover design is done by the marvelous Charlie Barnes. Um, she's a great artist, designer, illustrator. Um, so I want to start by explaining a little bit of Swimming on Highway N before I read the first three pages. Swimming on Highway N is a journey story, and it's about Madeline Danes. She's 60 years old. She's thrice widowed. She's moved from her fancy condo in Lake Michigan to a small town in Bourbon, Missouri, um, small town of Bourbon, Missouri, at the beginning of the Ozark Plateau, which is kind of uh, the start of the mountains and the hardwoods, and uh, it's beautiful, it's lovely, it's wild, it's rugged, it's kind of a poor little place. Um, the story begins in September 05, which is the height of the Iraq War. Um, some of you probably don't even remember that. Madeline spends her time thinking when she gets there, thinking and reliving her past. Um, she's trying to decide what she wants to do now that she's been widowed a third time. Um, her past includes not only three dead husbands, but an abusive mother she has run from, and a woman who still has the power to harm her, a woman who was uh, physically, but also emotionally abusive, mostly emotionally. Soon Madeline will fall for a new man, and they will set up in an old Volkswagen van um, to help carry a deserter to Canada. This is a young man who was in Iraq and refused to be redeployed and is running. They hope to get him into Canada. They hope they can. They hope there will be some freedom in Canada. They end up crossing the border at Washington State, and by some odd plot twist, they are taking um, her very old abusive mother with them, also Madeline's younger sister, 10 year younger sister, who was uh, as harmed at least as much, if not more by the mother. A cafe owner from Bourbon, Missouri is with them as well as the deserter's fiance. And on the way they pick up a brain damaged hitchhiker. And they're all being chased by a high school student bounty hunter, by a patriot group, and by the real villain of the story, a renegade nun who runs a teen center on the Blackfoot reservation. But for now, Madeline is soaking in her little swimming pool on Highway N, what she calls swimming. And um, these are the first pages of chapter one. And I also want to say that Madeline sometimes talks to and hears in her mind um, what she calls the ghost of Louise. Louise was her first mother-in-law and, um, and a woman she is uh, very fond of a woman whose advice she has always taken. Chapter one. Flesh on a hillside, a body barely covered in water. An old body, Louise's ghost said, and Madeline agreed. Sixty was old. Still, she spent her days in a bikini, soaking in tepid water in a child-sized pool in full view of Highway N. Not aging gracefully, Louise's ghost said, and Madeline agreed with that too. Her pool reminded her of the one Chris, Louise's son and Madeline's first husband, had back when they were both in second or third grade. Three blue rings and a flexible plastic bottom. She bought hers in April and spent hours puffing and blowing to make the rings full and bouncy. Then she searched for and found the faded red bikini in an unopened moving box marked miscellaneous. The bikini was a concession. She wanted to be bare, wanted her meat and bones blending with the dirt of the Ozarks. She joked with herself this could be a long delayed adolescent rebellion, a way of not following Louise at all. That she was 60 and Louise had been dead for eight years made it an easier rebellion to be sure. 
She smiled in the early morning heat and haze. Here she was, swimming on Highway N, making herself an object, a thing to notice if driving above. As you approach downtown Bourbon, look to your right and down the hill and see the old woman in the red bikini. The old woman was three dead husbands and an estranged daughter. The unruined woman. She'd not been ruined. Her first mother had not ruined her. She knew it as she sprawled on her hillside in early September 2005. From her pool on Highway N, she looked to her past, trying to shape the life of Madeline Dames into a story with the theme and forward movement, even with the last scenes unwritten. She remembered one summer night in 1957. I know guns, Wanda, Madeline's mother said. She stood beside the red plaid wing chair in the living room, the moon bright through the shears covering the picture window behind her. Madeline heard the snap of her gum. Madeline's father, Phil, sat in the chair and stared straight ahead. The shotgun Wanda held touched his left temple. Nothing that happens here will be an accident, Wanda said. He closed his eyes. Madeline stood against the far wall that led to the hallway, pressed tight against it. Angie stood on pudgy baby legs beside their father, silent but for her ragged breathing. Wanda laughed, causing Madeline to jump, but kept her eyes on Phil. All I have to do is pull the trigger. Madeline contracted her bones and muscles, willed her mass to give way to air, no more noticeable or offensive than the dust underneath the brake front. She took small sideways steps until she reached the edge of the wall opposite the picture window, then tiptoed into the hall and turned into the kitchen, not breathing until she reached the back door, which did not creak and which she closed silently behind her. She then ran across the backyard about 40 feet to the corner and the wire fence she had pried up weeks earlier for emergency escapes. She expected to be shot in the back as she ran, but she didn't turn around until she had squirmed flat on her stomach under the fence and was in the wooded area beside the unnamed creek. She sat down at the base of an elm and watched her house, listening for the shot. Into the air, she told herself when she heard it, the boom as always louder than she prepared for. Mom's shot. 48 years later, Madeline felt the backwards living was coming to an end. Something new was on the way. Later, after the journey, she would say all that wallowing in the past had been like backing up to go forward, moving back for a running start. But until the new arrived, she talked to herself about that night in 1957, knowing memory was false and seemed, did not mean, was. Had her father been afraid that night? Had he said anything about it later? No, that answer was a sure no. Maybe her mother's hormones were out of balance, her diet causing a blood sugar rush. Everyone has a breaking point. Alongside Highway N, Madeline knew all that as nonsense. She splashed water up onto a shoulder, squinted into the leaves of the giant oak throwing shade just to her left. The truth was, her mother had been exactly herself that night. To pretend there could be an explanation other than that her mother would happily torment her family, wanted to hurt and frighten her father, or any of them, and often did, was to cultivate a naivete of the kind that weakened a mind, diminished soul. And that wasn't the only or the first shotgun incident of Madeline's childhood, nor was the shotgun the sole threat. Kitchen knives, ball bats, plastic belts, screwdrivers, even cookware, all became extensions of Wanda's rage. And Madeline understood that 1957 wasn't hotter or crazier than the other years surrounding it. 
But that one sticky summer night lived on. It started with her father asking why there were noodles in the meatloaf. He asked it thrice, and Madeline watched her mother's face change colors. It was a spectacular display, and by the end, Wanda was the gray-green of the sky before a tornado, the skin around her eyes and lips gray like the lead pipes in the basement. Madeline Needlecedar was the name given her at birth, but she'd been Danes for 44 years. Each of them, and the eight or nine before them, lived according to Louise's advice, don't look back, until now. An air horn blasted from a set semi speeding along highway N, 60 or so feet above Madeline's pool. She waved. It was that kid from Sullivan who now drove for Snyder. She sipped from her plastic tumbler of Chablis, taken over ice on days like this when the air temperature topped 90. She'd done good. Some girls would have suffered from a mother as bad as Wanda, but Madeline had merely exchanged her for a better model. Her first and only plan was to lead Christopher Dames, her childhood buddy, out behind his parents' garage and rub her hand along the zipper in his jeans. They were both 15 and a half, she said then. She kissed him by sticking her tongue in his mouth and said he could touch her wherever he wanted, said he could try things. Intercourse, she said, using a word from the health education film strips. He did try things, but had insisted she call it love. He said he was in love. So she said she was too, both of them claiming they were in love as they put their underpants back on after. And maybe they were, she thought now. Maybe saying so made it true. The third time was best because they both claimed to feel like their skin had been lit on fire. Eventually, victory. Her period stopped, a mere 17 months after they started. She'd chosen Chris for the gently smiling Louise, his mother and her mother number two. She had picked Louise out years earlier.